Thanks to The Great Courses Plus for supporting PBS Digital Studios. The currently accepted cosmological description of our universe is called the Lambda CDM model, and it's built on a very specific idea about the behaviour of dark energy and dark matter. It's accepted because it does a great job of explaining our observations of the universe. That is, perhaps, until now. Subtle clues are emerging that the accepted model for the nature of dark energy and dark matter may not be all that. We saw the first such clue recently in our episode on the crisis in cosmology. Today, we're doing a space-time journal club to reveal another clue. We're looking at a new paper in Nature Astronomy, Cosmological Constraints from the Hubble Diagram of Quasars at High Redshift by Rizzoliti and Lusso. It hints that the cosmological constant may not be so constant after all. In fact, it may be increasing. If this is true, then our prediction for the future of our universe looks very different, and may involve the entire universe tearing itself to shreds at the subatomic level in the Big Rip. Crazy, right? But hopefully before that happens, we can try to understand it. First, let's review the current accepted model then the problems with that model, and finally this new study, which tries to resolve those problems, but may have made things way more mysterious. Back in the late 90s, two teams of astronomers accidentally discovered dark energy. They were measuring the distances to supernovae to track the changing size of the expanding universe. Instead of slowing down, as was expected, that expansion turned out to be accelerating. It was revolutionary and radical at the time. But a few Nobel Prizes later, and dark energy is now textbook cosmology. Those textbooks tell us that this accelerating expansion is what you expect if empty space has a constant energy density, so that more space means more dark energy. Mathematically, we represent a constant vacuum energy with Einstein's cosmological constant, or lambda. Those same textbooks talk about dark matter, an invisible stuff whose gravitational influence overwhelms all types of visible matter combined. We see its effect in the rotation and movement of galaxies, and in the bending of light due to its space warping gravity. Decades of study and calculation suggest that dark matter is a particle of some unknown type, cold, diffuse, and immune to electromagnetic interactions of any type. In the textbooks, this type of cold dark matter sits alongside the cosmological constant as our best description of how the universe behaves on the larger scales. Constant dark energy, cold dark matter, or the Lambda CDM model. We also call it the concordance model, a term that just means the current best accepted picture. Okay, so now to the crisis, which we looked at in detail here. Our observations of the cosmic microwave background reveal the starting conditions of the universe. The balance of dark energy, dark matter, and everything else at the earliest of times when the CMB was released, long before the first stars ever formed. So, we apply the concordance model to these starting conditions to calculate how the universe should have evolved from those early times, and how fast it should be expanding today. This prediction doesn't seem to agree with the observations. Let's talk about those observations. The expansion history of the universe is typically measured using the same type of supernova observations that first discovered dark energy, type 1a supernovae, which result from exploding white dwarf stars. These explode in very predictable ways, releasing a predictable amount of energy. By comparing that expected energy output with the amount that actually reaches our telescopes, we can figure out precisely how far away the supernova was when it exploded. Type 1a supernovae are what we call standard candles, objects of known brightness that can be used to find distance. If we have lots of supernovae at different distances, then we have a set of rulers spanning both time and space. The most distant Type 1a supernova we've seen is so far away that its light has been travelling to us for around 75% of the age of the universe. So our rulers span much of cosmic time, and together they give us an expansion history. Taken on its own, 
That history is what we expect in a Lambda CDM cosmology. The cosmic microwave background is also consistent with Lambda CDM, but the exact numbers it gives are different. In particular, the universe appears to be expanding faster than expected given what we see in the cosmic microwave background. Something is wrong. It may be an issue with how we determine the starting conditions of the universe, or it may be our measurements of supernovae. Or it may be that Lambda CDM is wrong. Perhaps the cosmological constant is not so constant after all, or dark matter is not so cold after all. But before we throw away the textbooks, perhaps we should think about where the measurements might have gone wrong. Perhaps surprisingly, our measurements of the state of the early universe via the CMB may be more reliable than our measurement of its subsequent expansion via supernovae. Part of the reason for that is that supernovae aren't bright enough to see through all of cosmic history. We missed the first 25% and we found too few supernovae over the first 50% of cosmic time. That early period is extremely important for understanding the true behaviour of dark energy. This motivated Rizaliti and Lusso to seek a completely new way to measure that expansion history. In order to properly measure the full expansion history of the universe, we want a new, brighter standard candle. Enter the quasar. These things are by far the most awesome of all astrophysical phenomena as we conclusively demonstrated in this episode. Quasars are a black hole feeding frenzy. When matter falls too close to a black hole, it forms a superheated vortex pouring into the black hole, an accretion disk. If it's a supermassive black hole doing the feeding, the accretion disk shines so bright that it can be seen to the ends of the universe. We call such objects quasars. Quasars are at first glance pretty crappy standard candles. They can have a huge range of energy output depending on the mass of the black hole and how much fuel it's getting. It's very hard to distinguish between a brighter quasar that's further away or a fainter quasar that's closer to us. In general, quasars are a hot mess. Literally. It's not just the accretion disk. The energy produced in that disk powers all sorts of crazy energetic activity. There are vast winds that spray into the galaxy, giant jets that can punch out into intergalactic space. And also, hovering above the accretion disk, we have a hot atmosphere that radiates X-rays. This last one, the X-ray corona, may help us make sense of everything. The new study uses the brightness of the X-ray corona to figure out the true energy output of quasars. It works like this. When photons of ultraviolet light radiate from the accretion disk, they bump into extremely energetic electrons in the region above the disk. In that encounter, they can get boosted to even higher energies, right up to X-rays, in a process called Compton upscattering. All quasars shine in X-rays due to this process. And as you might expect, the brighter the quasar is in ultraviolet light, the more X-rays it can produce. That doesn't sound particularly helpful just yet. If UV and X-ray light track each other perfectly, there will be no way to differentiate the effects of distance and intrinsic energy output. Both effects could cause the UV and the X-ray light to brighten or dim in the same way. Except, here's the weird thing. UV and X-ray don't track perfectly. There's a diminishing return in how much X-ray you can squeeze out of the X-ray corona. As UV brightness goes up, X-ray brightness does increase, but not one to one. That sounds like an obscure point, but this is going to give us our standard candle. See, the ratio between the amount of X-ray versus ultraviolet light depends on the true ultraviolet energy output of the quasar. That means you can just measure that ratio, the relative brightness in X-ray versus UV, and you know the true UV brightness. When compared to the observed UV brightness, that gives you distance. Now, there's a bit of variation in the relationship between UV and X-ray brightness. There's random scatter. But if you make the measurement with enough quasars, then this scatter can be averaged away. Fortunately, there are a lot of quasars out there, far more than known supernovae. 
Rizaliti and Lusso cobbled together around 1600 quasars with both ultraviolet and X-ray observations. Most were from giant surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the XMM Newton X-ray catalog. They also added extra X-ray observations with the XMM Newton satellite. The final sample spans nearly the entire history of the universe. The most distant existed when the universe was less than 10% of its current age. This graph is from the paper. It's what we call a Hubble diagram. It basically shows the distance of the quasar that we get from the UV to X-ray ratio versus redshift, which is how much the quasar's light got stretched as it traveled the expanding universe. Putting these two together measures the expansion history. The yellow and blue dots are our quasars, 1600 of them. The red dots show average distances in redshift bins. And that dashed line, that reflects the expansion history expected in a universe with constant dark energy, a lambda CDM concordance universe. The red points are consistently below the dashed line for large distances and redshifts. That means the light from these quasars appears more stretched out, more redshifted on average than it should be given their distance and given textbook Lambda CDM cosmology. The solution? Well, that black line is the model of the expansion history of the universe in which dark energy is not constant, but instead is getting stronger as the universe ages. It fits the data pretty well. Very roughly speaking, if the expansion of the universe is accelerating even more than we thought, that could explain the extra stretching of the light from these distant quasars. So what does this mean? Are concordance and the cosmological constant dead? Is dark matter getting stronger? Is the big rip about to happen? Let's start with the latter, just in case. At the moment, dark energy is only strong enough to accelerate the expansion of space on the larger scales. It's not strong enough to have any effect on the space inside a galaxy, so the Milky Way, and certainly the solar system are safe. But if dark energy is getting stronger, then eventually it could cause the universe to expand inside galaxies, inside planetary systems, and eventually even inside atoms. This scenario is known as the Big Rip, and we will probably do a whole episode on it at some point. It's a potential end of the universe in which space-time rips itself to shreds at the subatomic scale due to the increasing strength of dark energy. Now, before you dust off your end is nigh sandwich board, a couple things. First, any potential Big Rip is tens of billions of years away. Second, if dark energy has changed in the past, that doesn't mean it's steadily increasing. In fact, there are alternative ideas to try to resolve the conflict between the CMB and supernovae, and now the quasar results. For example, there's the idea that dark energy started out much stronger and dropped off rapidly, or even that it oscillates over time. All very exciting. But the most likely explanation is still that concordance Lambda CDM is right, and there's an issue with the measurements or calculations. Perhaps a systematic problem with the way supernova and or quasar distances are determined. Or even an issue with the cosmic microwave background calculations. Also, there are still relatively few very different quasars with good X-ray measurements. So maybe the random variations in the UV to X-ray ratio by chance gave a false result. These issues will be resolved with more X-ray observations and more testing of this new technique. What we have here is a tantalizing clue that our accepted understanding of the factors that drive the expansion of the universe may be off. Perhaps this is the clue we need to finally better understand this stuff we call dark energy. And even if the concordance model ends up reigning supreme, even if dark energy proves to be constant after all, which I suspect it will, we'll have a new independent measure of its existence and behavior. One way or another, I guess it'd be nice to know whether dark energy will one day rip to shreds the subatomic fabric of space-time. Thanks to The Great Courses Plus for supporting PBS Digital Studios. The Great Courses Plus is a digital learning service with over 11,000 courses and lectures. 
and their lessons are given by professors and experts from institutions as diverse as the Ivy League, the Smithsonian, and the Culinary Institute of America. And their courses cover everything from physics and multivariate calculus to learning how to play chess or become a better photographer. But if you're interested in going deeper into astrophysics, then you'll want to check out the course Black Holes, Tides and Curved Space-Time – Understanding Gravity. This is a series of 24 30-minute lectures on gravity that can help you get a deeper understanding of both the history and the cutting-edge research around one of the most important concepts in all of astrophysics, which you can access by visiting www.thegreatcoursesplus.com slash spacetime. All you have to do is click on the link in the description below to start today. Last week, we had a conversation with Richard Branson about his recent successful test of Spaceship 2, which recently carried the first private passenger into space on a private craft. Richard also shared his dreams for the future of human space travel. You guys shared your own thoughts too. A few of you dispute the use of the term spaceship for a craft that doesn't reach orbit. Indeed, Virgin Galactic's Spaceship 1 and Spaceship 2 crossed the boundary into space past the higher Kármán line in the case of Spaceship 1, but neither entered orbit. They followed suborbital trajectories, which left them in space for only minutes. Now, in my book, if you ship someone into space, it's a spaceship. But these terms aren't well defined yet, so you could insist on your definition too. That said, Virgin Orbit, a spin-off of Virgin Galactic, has an air launch rocket that is expected to put satellites into orbit this year. It's called Launcher 1, and it'll launch from White Knight 2, the same plane that carries Spaceship 2. Paul C mentioned a couple of other promising spacecraft that aren't getting as much attention as they should. We didn't have time to fit more into that episode, but there's a ton of cool stuff happening. Paul mentions Strato Launch, an air launch plane much bigger than the Spaceship 2 launcher and designed for orbital rocket launches as well as space planes. This is another project of Bert Rutan, designer of the Virgin Galactic craft. Dustin Edwards hopes that I got to kite surf on Richard Branson's private island. Well, actually I did. Thanks, Dustin. Well, I kited. I'm still working on the surfing part. And many of you asked me to elaborate on how I ended up on that island in the first place. Well, happy to oblige. I flew to San Juan, then to Tortola, followed by a boat to Necker Island. Pretty mundane, really. Though getting off is another story, as Branson himself actually kite surfs from the island. I mean, when the space plane is in the shop. And a surprising number of you asked whether I was hunted like an animal across the island, which is apparently what happens on billionaire private islands. No, nothing like that happens on Necker Island. It's more the tennis and water sports style of billionaire private island, less the hunt human shuttle for sports type. What happens on other billionaire private islands? Who can say? From what I hear about Bill Gates' island? Actually, I've never heard anything about that island. Hmm, suspicious. <laughs>